person and walk again where poverty and illness are. Before long, this soil will harbor only sickness and knowledge become a shadow starved of the sun. In this clear air hangs the voice of handmade disaster, man-made, this loss of wise memory. The priests have warned us, disease is God-given, and only the power of the church should relieve it. Should woman dare cure without study, she is a witch and must die. I have lost and now look for that fearless connection between us. The offense of commitment. The commitment a crime. Love a slow sentence of death. So, healer. Wise women are now forbidden from study. Midwifing. Herb remedies called old wives' tales. And with this superstition, good women have perished. Now I am sent for in secret, a fearful heretic for the wretched. Throughout history, healers and midwives were part of every community, taking care of the sick and passing on traditions of health. Often they were the women of one's own family. But as medicine became professionalized, women were deliberately excluded. Physicians had little knowledge to offer and health care was exchanged for money. Responsibility for health eventually changed hands from communities to the state and the medical profession. But in that exchange, the social conditions which produced ill health became no one's responsibility. As the patterns of working and living changed, so illnesses changed. The role of health care moved away from prevention to medical intervention. The way we respond to the needs of the population and the care of the sick is a reflection of the society in which we live. The steady advance of industrialization and city life had a massive impact on the landscape and the daily life of people from all levels of society. As the population moved to work in the cities and towns, pollution and disease followed hard behind. Overcrowded rooms in dilapidated buildings with no sanitation, combined with poverty, malnutrition and long working hours to create a deadly breeding ground for disease. Rickets, tuberculosis and infectious epidemics were rife. The 19th century needed fit and healthy workers for the rapid expansion of industry and fit and healthy soldiers for the expanding empires abroad. It was only a matter of time until cholera hit and it did not confine itself to working-class slums. As political unrest spread on the continent, so disease spread through the shared water supplies of rich and poor alike. The public outcry for action and reform came not just from concern for the health of the workers and the welfare of the poor, but also to pacify the unrest of a workforce which was beginning to organize itself politically. The reforms which followed improved working conditions and sanitation, but these reforms were initiated by lay people rather than the medical profession. The first Public Health Act in 1848, pioneered by Edwin Chadwick, pressured local authorities to supply clean water and to remove the sewage choking the rivers and polluting the towns. At first, this was resisted by the private water companies and the commercial sewerage dealers who stood to lose their profits. But Chadwick's work did have an effect on public consciousness and established the need for the state to act for social reform. 
The second half of the 19th century saw the beginnings of the public health movement and later health education, stimulated by fear and concern, fear of disease and concern for workers' lives. Factory acts regulated the length of the working day and the employment of women and children. While these led to some improvements in the health of workers, the reforms also served the need of employers to have a more productive workforce. But it was the first time concern was shown for the health of the individual. The demands of industry and the empire acted like spurs on the health reforms. But legislation, like medical knowledge, was piecemeal and slow. The Crimean War revealed dismal hospital conditions and standards of hygiene for the treatment of war casualties. For many of these men, joining the army is a last resort to escape the poverty and lack of employment at home. But before we came here, the filth and overcrowding of the wards together with the lack of care, meant that even if the soldiers did not die from Russian bullets, they were likely to perish from cholera or dysentery. The first requirement of any hospital should be that it will cause the sick no further harm. The work of volunteer nurses like Florence Nightingale and Mary Seacole encouraged the fall in the mortality rate of wounded soldiers from over 40% to 2% in the two years of the war. Their work made the simple connection between hygiene, nutrition and health, which brought about the changes that were to form the basis of preventative medicine. War needs a fit male fighting force drawn from the numbers of the working classes. At the outbreak of the Boer War in 1899, out of every thousand conscripts, 330 were rejected as being unfit to fight. Added to the figures of the subsequent loss of life through failing health, only two out of every five volunteers remained as effective soldiers. The men we see are the price we have paid for our great empire. The wages of peace have been reaped at the cost of the war. It has taken this to find our men so small, so underweight, so starved. Each day we reject those with heart troubles, weak lungs, rheumatism, flat feet and bad teeth. We have already lowered the minimum stature from five foot six to five foot three. And it seems now we must recommend the height of five feet to recruit enough soldiers. Although public health reforms had made some improvements to the environment, they were not enough to produce healthier soldiers and workers. If workers were to be the machines of industry and military competition, then they needed more investment. Working class mothers and family life became the focus of blame. It must have been their ignorance that was responsible for the physical and moral degradation of the population. The cause of the weakened physical condition of the poor was thought to be hereditary. If drunkenness, pauperism and criminality were the cause rather than the effect of poverty, then these vices could be ended forever if the reproduction of the poorer classes was controlled. Birth rate became a national issue and children a national asset. The solution was to elevate women to the status of mothers of the race, raising the next generation of soldiers and workers. Mothers and young women were instructed and organized by voluntary societies and local government in the skills of mothercraft. 
At the turn of the century, too many children were dying before they reached their first birthday. How can they talk of the proper feeding of our babies when they won't tell us how to prevent the next one from coming along too soon? Our rooms are so damp and crowded that even if I had water, I could spend the whole day scrubbing and nothing would become cleaner. No amount of instruction can give my husband work, nor give us more food when there is no money. It cost much less to blame the mothers. A parliamentary committee in 1904 made 63 recommendations to vastly improve social conditions. From these recommendations, only two of the least expensive options, which needed no social change, were implemented. Childcare and cooking. The glass, with fiery fluid filled, is passed. The shrinking wife just wets her lips at first. And then, more daring grown, she sips, then drinks at last, and thus acquires a never-dying thirst. The causes of poverty and criminality were laid at the doors of alcohol, squalor and moral ignorance. Early health visiting concentrated on dirt in the home, and infant dysentery. In 1904, the British Medical Association petitioned the Board of Education to provide health instruction in schools, including temperance. The temperance movement visited schools with slides and lectures and developed a syllabus as a compulsory part of teachers' training. Many of the teachers decided it was irrelevant to preach about bad hygiene and drink if they were not the cause of poverty and illness and chose instead to teach physical education. A space had been created for the state, voluntary societies and the medical profession to assert their knowledge and authority and to claim moral sanctions over working class life. Impelled thus by the monster he did nurse, and which has proved an everlasting curse. He, with a single blow, crushed out the life of his once happy but now wretched wife. There was still no organized provision for individual health care by the beginning of the First World War, although Lloyd George had introduced national insurance and the panel system so that working men would receive free medical care from general practitioners. For the rest of the population, health care remained chaotic. A combination of charity, voluntary organizations, private nursing homes for those with money, and the much-hated poor law institutions for those with none. There were so many different systems and specialities that a working-class family with money could receive medical care from as many as nine different doctors working for five separate organizations. The differences in the services available were reflected by the regional differences of unemployment, poverty and the death rate. Regional differences which remain to this day. By the arrival of the First World War, health fears were renewed by the discovery of a new generation of soldiers unfit to fight. 90% of the working class population over 30 years old had been infected by tuberculosis at some point in their life. Venereal disease, which had been steadily increasing since the turn of the century, worsened during the war. In response, the first government grant for health education was given. The earlier messages concentrated on preventing men rather than women from contracting venereal disease. Stimulated by a pragmatic need for soldiers and moral concern, health education was seen by those on the receiving end as propaganda preached by people who thought they knew better talking about unmentionable subjects. But some progress had been made by the end of the war with renewed concern about the health of recruits, advances in medicine and surgery, and the organization of hospital care for the casualties of war. The pressure was mounting from industry, trade unionism 
and women's organizations impressing the need for maternity, childcare and living conditions to become important issues in the health of the nation. By 1919, the Ministry of Health was established to initiate centralized planning for services. The economic depression and the hunger of the 1930s produced diseases and poverty despite the public health reforms of the previous 50 years. Measurements of children's health through the school medical system, which had slowly improved since the 1920s, showed a sharp drop, despite the introduction of school milk and meals by 1938. even notice it now but I find myself working alongside of people who wouldn't give me the time of day if there wasn't a war on it's the first time I've ever felt that what I do will make some kind of difference to the world everyone seems to feel like that bombs don't stop to decide who they're going to fall on this was someone's home once maybe it's no tragedy that some of these old dumps have been blown up because now they'll have to build new places. Sometimes it's hard to see how anything can ever grow after all this destruction, and that you will be lucky enough to stay alive to see it. But you can't help but think it's got to be better. At least the kids are safe and out of the way, and I don't need to worry about where their next meal... <sighs> The centralized organization of the hospital and health services needed for the Second World War gave new opportunities for progress. The 30s had strained voluntary services and charitable hospitals to near bankruptcy, and access to health care had still depended solely on who you were, what you were, and how much money you had. At the Ministry of Health, health education formed part of the wartime contingency plans. There were fears that epidemics could break out after the bombing of cities, and there was a need to protect children not only from the dangers of war, but from infectious diseases. Expectant fathers, you need nothing extra, unless it's the commiseration of your friends. Expectant mothers, you do need something extra. No, not pills or potions or a bottle of stout, but vitamin extras, cod liver oil and orange juice. You want that child to have the constitution, if not the appearance of a horse, to be like daddy? Take your vitamin extras, oh ye expectant mothers. The food policy and rationing system saw the fair distribution of food supplies right across the population, and it ensured that people with special needs like Manual workers, expectant mothers and children received enough nutrition. The health of the surviving population improved rapidly during the years of the war and continued to do so afterwards. Oxford has had the unusual experience of inspiring reform. Sir William Beveridge, 
working in the quiet of University College, of which he is master, has produced a social document of revolutionary importance. Into its An economic plan, based on the theories of Maynard Keynes for a new Britain, was being drawn up during the war to prevent the economic crisis of the 30s from being repeated. Part of the plan was the formation of the welfare state. The publication of the Beveridge Report during the course of the war was useful propaganda for the troops, fighting for the new Britain. The state would be responsible not just for free health provision for all, but also for fuller employment and a healthy economy in the form of healthy workers. New developments in medicine and health care, previously only available to a fee-paying middle class, were now there for everyone. Although it was a plan for stability rather than for revolutionary social reform, it was for millions of people a symbol of the social ideals for which the nation had gone to battle. For the state, it was a response to the heartbreak of the 30s slump and a reward for fighting the war. It's going to be hard for the men coming back when they find everything so changed. This city will never be the same again. Well, let's hope so. It gave old Churchill a bit of a shock when everyone voted for Labour after all he'd done for us. But things won't ever change if you have the same people running the show. People expect more now. And there will be doctors when they need them. And food and jobs. When everything is destroyed like this, there's a chance to start from scratch. To change things. To make them how you want them to be. But it seems to me no one is really asking us. If the jobs are the same as they were before, if people can still profit from others' misfortunes, and if money is still more important than living in a safer way, then nothing will ever change for good. This leaflet is coming through your letterbox one day soon, or maybe you have already had your copy. Read it carefully. Whoever was in control of it in the office had left the tannoy on and we heard the announcement come over the radio news that it had been passed in the Houses of Parliament and we were really going to get the National Health Service and a great cheer went up. It was a, 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 a relief to know that um, no matter what went wrong, it could be appendicitis, you could have an accident going to work, your child might be ill, but no matter what went wrong, um, help would be there, you know. But the National Health Scheme did not abolish inequalities in health. In order to gain support for the plans, an Iron Bevan, the Minister for Health of the post-war Labour government, had made concessions to the medical profession. Doctors and teaching hospitals remained financially and politically independent. Private fees and pay beds were never abolished. Inequalities in illness and treatment between rich and poor were never abolished. The integration of preventative medicine and curative medicine was resisted, resulting in more than half of the budget going to the well-equipped teaching hospitals. The cost of the service began to escalate alarmingly. It seemed that the more medical health care was provided, the more people needed. With the dangers of war now gone, and the public health reforms and the conquering of infections and epidemics, there should be no further reason for ill health and early death. But one in four people still die before they are of retirement age. The new killers are well known to us, cancer, heart disease and stroke. Each has ways of prevention. So if preventable, why not prevent it? In advanced industrialized societies, a growing proportion of people die of diseases of degeneration caused by stress or diseases of maladaption caused by a changing environment that the human body has not adjusted to. The journey to work is becoming ridiculous. Bus, work, bus, sleep, 
and then work again. And I'm going to be late. God, I need a fag. Where's all this traffic coming from? They build more roads and get more cars. I read somewhere that smoking's bad for my health, but my doctor says if it helps my nerves, then not to worry. Can't be any more dangerous than trying to cross the road. Ugh, it tastes disgusting with all these fumes. Health education of the 50s and 60s tended to be poorly funded, taking less than half of 1% of the NHS budget. Although specific information, like the immunization of children and the danger of German measles during pregnancy, were quite successful, health messages to try and change people's behavior were not. Decisions about what and whose behavior needed changing were imposed from above by the government and medical experts. But the patterns of living, of work, diet, housing and the family had drastically changed since the war. Campaigns and propaganda had little relevance to the quality of daily life for most people. When they built this estate, I think they thought we all had cars. Fat chance. I walked miles just to buy the bread and I have to drag the kids along because there's nowhere safe to leave them. I wish we weren't so far away from my mum. God knows if we'll get our transfer. It's been a year now and I've heard nothing. Eight floors and a lift that keeps going wrong. It really isn't fair on me. Or the kids. The new homes needed for the expanding city population of the 50s and 60s created new health hazards. The cheap and quick solution to the housing need was systems building, multi-storey flats for a high density of people. Design faults began to appear almost as soon as people moved in. High buildings in isolated estates with a large concentration of children and a lack of even the most basic facilities invited accidents and pollution. Claustrophobic architecture and the lack of common space demoralized the people who lived there. Litter, graffiti and vandalism rapidly became the alienated response to the new environment. The attempt to solve one problem had created others, both physical and mental. Badly insulated rooms were cold and damp. Condensation and mold created bronchial symptoms and respiratory diseases. The new social conditions not only created stress, but stress-relieving habits, like smoking. The National Anti-Smoking Campaign is a history of a health education message in search of an audience. The effects of smoking were not widely known until years after the habit had become well established. Singled out as the primary cause of lung cancer and later heart disease, many approaches had been tried. From general health warnings and scare tactics, the focus moved to women as wives and mothers, urged to give up for the sake of their children rather than for themselves. Young people are approached as vain and as caring only about their appearance and what others may think of them. The messages assumed the audience lived in a political and social vacuum and that smoking was a question of choice. In the vacuum, no laws of cause and effect exist, no vested financial interests, no addiction, and no support. At last I can let them out. First I worry about keeping them in with their coughs, then about letting them loose where I can't see them. We were all going mad cooped up. I've started getting bronchitis now, and the doctor said to pack up smoking, my one luxury. Maybe it's the damp. The council took one look and said it was my fault, that it's from the steam of cooking and washing, even breathing. What do they expect us to do? It's a moral judgment. It's a sense of disapproval from people to say, I don't think you should smoke. I don't think smoking's a good idea, personally. 
but that's my opinion and I have no right to tell anyone else that they deserve death and destruction for doing something I disapprove of. Yes, there is evidence to suggest that certain illnesses are as a result of, of smoking, but there are certain illnesses which are as a result of industrial po pollution, fluoride in the water, chemical additives in our food, and I think it's very wrong of any government to point the finger at the person because they smoke and not take responsibility for community health in other areas. If you keep on saying to somebody, stop doing this, stop doing that, immediately they hear it again, they switch off. People won't stop doing things unless they want to stop doing things for themselves. And so you've got to motivate them if you want to motivate them a lot more subtly. But to my mind, you'd spend your time and money much better on doing things that they want to achieve. If they come to you and say, I want to stop smoking, then by all means provide them with the advice that they can have to help them stop smoking. Despite the banning of advertisements, tobacco promotion is still with us in disguised form. The powerful tobacco lobby struggles with the medical lobby, resulting in contradictory messages. Recent figures show that the anti-smoking message only reaches the middle classes, working class people, particularly women, forming a growing percentage of smokers. It's very difficult to prove that prevention works and it's very difficult to make a case for spending large amounts of money on prevention. To say nothing of the fact that a lot of prevention is politically very sensitive and one of the major areas of prevention of illness in this country would be in effect wiping out cigarette smoking. But what happens, the cigarette companies are spending something like three or four hundred million pounds a year on persuading people to smoke cigarettes. Well, their cigarettes, but that's health, that's health damaging expenditure. And uh, the Health Education Authority gets, what, about a million, a million and a half per year to try and persuade people not to smoke. I mean, it's laughable, isn't it? So there's a lot of vested interest in keeping people ill. I think most people acknowledge that the tobacco industry does produce enormous profits for the government, who all the time says, you mustn't smoke, but at the same time doesn't do anything about the tobacco industry. And I think this is a paradox, and it's the sort of paradox that makes people actually not believe propaganda. I think that propaganda, to be effective, has to be the truth. The first smoke of heroin can make you throw up. But some people still go back for more. If you get into it, your looks will start to go. And you'll feel even worse. If you depend on it, chances are you'll end up sharing a needle. Trust me. And if it's infected with AIDS, where does that leave you? Uh, I'm glad to say, and this is not, I hope, puffing out our chests and uh, being complacent, but. Uh, it is generally felt in the world uh, uh, today that we took the AIDS issue far more seriously, far more quickly, and got advice out to the public far more quickly than any other country, far more quickly, say, than they did in the United States, even though their problem there is much greater. I mean, I don't think any other country has put a document into every household in the way that we did. And certainly one or two of our campaign advertisements, which were designed to shock uh, people, but shock them in a constructive way. I mean, not to offer them no hope, not to panic them, but to, uh, but to make people aware that this was not a problem that they could just say was down to somebody else. I think these were seen to have been not just very relevant to the British uh, situation, but actually containing a lot of uh, worthwhile data for people to apply in other countries. And we're trying to find the mechanisms to share these experiences. In the first AIDS campaign, impersonal and catastrophic imagery connecting sex with death demoralized the sick and terrorized the well, creating a dangerous rift of mutual concern and responsibility between them. War had been declared not on the virus, but on those who carry it. But the promise of plague has become a phony war. The advertisers have sold us AIDS, not information. From the industry's own figures, 80% of the consumers of the message felt that AIDS had no relevance to their lives. I think to talk about health campaigns, the immediate campaign that springs to mind is the one about AIDS, which is currently 
doing the rounds and I don't know that it's about health. I don't think it's telling us how to be healthy, it's just telling us how not to contract this disease. And I think it's also building fear into people. The moral censure of the message has again made sex, drugs and death unmentionable subjects. Few lessons have been learned from past campaigns and results are not measured. More explicit and targeted information has been reserved for the groups identified as being most at risk. The more expensive, government-orchestrated national campaigns seen by the widest audience are targeted at the remaining population, a population assumed to be heterosexual, monogamous and middle class, and who are terrified of the sick. I think there is a tremendous amount of paranoia put around with the advertising campaign for AIDS, and I don't think that's about health. So I think there's a very mixed message coming across. I think it's also quite similar to the health campaigns I've seen about smoking, which are a warning that this will happen to you if you continue to behave in this way. It doesn't say how you can increase your state of well-being so you don't need to smoke cigarettes. It doesn't address that issue at all. And so I think health campaigns are very one-sided and the word health, I think, is misused in them. So who would one actually argue is in fact responsible for the individual's health? Digby Anderson. Well, in the end, the individual must be responsible for his health and or her health and must take fundamental responsibility for it. We've just heard a litany of all the things which have to do with health. There is no way that a government could be responsible for all those. In the end, it comes down to the individual. And what about if the individual can't cope? If the individual can't, genuinely can't hope, then there is perfectly good, good reason to help him. But there's no reason to help everybody indiscriminately um, when they do, when they should be encouraged in a society which has more information than ever before about such things to look after themselves. I really don't think any one person has the right to say that to people because it's judging them. And as a healer or as anyone concerned with health, you need to be very open-minded and you need to increase somebody's self-esteem. And if you're judging them, you're just piling it on. You're just making them feel worse about themselves and making them, it feeds into their belief that they deserve ill health. And I think what we need to do is say everybody, every single person on this planet deserves good health. Mum, mm? what's that? Ask your father, darling. Why? Has he got it? Read this brochure on talking to your children about AIDS. Terry. Yeah? What's safer sex? Talking dirty on the phone? Oh, Unlike the UK, some other countries have generated AIDS information from a much more grassroots, community-based position. Instead of sexual disapproval and despair, theirs is a positive message of shared responsibility. Hey Vicky, I've got a condom. You know how to use it? Sure. Well now all you need is someone to use it with. Everything you ever wanted to know about condoms, these and other AIDS brochures are available from Medicare, Social Security offices and Commonwealth and State Health Departments. I could well say that if people drink too much or if they eat too much unsuitable foods or if they smoke too much, they are much more likely to become seriously ill and die before their time. And that if they didn't do those things, they would live a much longer and ultimately much happier life. And I feel government is entitled, and agencies like the Health Education Authority are entitled to put out that advice if that's what we believe to be so and it's scientifically based. But I don't think we have a right to prohibit people from taking their own decisions. And I think there will always be people who will fly in the face of good advice, and most of us do from time to time. I mean, I drink, I'm sure. Most of the people who watch this program drink. Some of people continue to smoke. And I think in the end, you can't, in a civilised democracy, 
take the individual out of this because once you get people used to thinking they know better than the individual and that they are entitled to as it were erect prohibitions to prevent an individual doing something to cause himself harm of that kind i think you're on a pretty slippery slope downhill at the moment we're very much conditioned in terms of thinking of health policy as something that's the responsibility of the department of health Clearly, if we accept that the major determinants of people's health and inequalities in health are things like income, employment, housing, etc., then the responsibility for promoting health is something that cuts across the work of all government departments. Preventing ill health attracts little attention either medically or financially. The results are slow and difficult to measure and excite none of the high-profile glamour of well-resourced heroic medicine. Prevention could also represent a challenge to the role of both political and medical professionalism by empowering individuals to lead the way in decisions about their own well-being. Advice and information are not enough unless the individual to whom they are addressed can change where and how they live. The control of health and medicine is about power either the power of a free individual over their own lives or the power of political and financial interests to set the agenda for health and hence the political and economic agenda for society. It is a misconception that there is infinite demand then as far as finite resources are concerned, of course we can't spend absolutely the uh, um, optimum amount of money, the, the maximum amount of money on health care. I grant there have to be limitations. But where you draw that line on limitations is entirely a political decision. People say keep politics out of health. You can't keep politics out of health. The NHS is the major, the largest employer in this country huge amounts of money being spent on health care in this country. But where you draw the line on how much you're going to spend is a political decision made by Parliament. It does seem to me that you cannot have one group deciding how much money goes where. And that means neither the doctors, nor politicians alone, nor any other group on its own. But it has to be society as a whole. When sick, Everyone deserves healing because healing is getting back to our birthright, which is health. So I think everybody deserves good health, and I think this is the dilemma with healing that we're faced with. Some people actually cannot afford good health, and I think that's devastating. The health debate has been structured by a concentration on private medicine framed by the language of the free market, the consumer's right to choose. The limitations of resources are determined by the individual's ability to pay and the efficient use of available resources. Efficiency defined not by need, but by profit. It's my view that we need to have a slightly more com competition orientated, competitive orientated um, health service. I think the providers of health care, that's the hospitals and the doctors, ought to be a bit more aware of consumers and consumers should have more choice in, in the type of service they're able to get and, and feel that the people who buy those services on their behalf, which is the government, if you like, or the, the local health authority, is buying from the most efficient and effective provider. And if it means that the individual, the consumer, the patient, has got to travel a little further to receive the services now, tomorrow, rather than three months' time, I think that's to be encouraged. I think that's, that's what's going to happen. People will be given, if you like, a geographic choice. They'll be told, you can have your operation tomorrow if you'll go to the nearest big city, but you have to be willing to travel to have that done. What we can't guarantee is that they're going to have everything they want in their local district cottage or district general hospital. And I think that's a good thing, because I don't think every hospital should provide every service. It's been the view of the NHS up, up till now that almost every hospital should provide everything. And I think that's wasteful. Some hospitals are good at doing hip operations, other hospitals are good at doing neurosurgery, and they should specialise. And there should be competition between hospitals and between doctors to provide services. At crisis points in history, governments have required healthy citizens, either for the needs of industry or for war, and now as consumers. 
At these crisis points, social reforms and medical progress have been achieved, although not always for the best reasons. Now the health system is in the process of radical change. It could be destroyed. It could be built as it was before. Or it could be created for the needs of its users. I find it difficult to get my head around the idea that there is a cake and we have certain percentages for health education because I think it's based, it's coming from lack. It's saying we have a limited amount of power, a limited amount of resources. And I think it creates a poverty consciousness. For instance, if you say we do have a cake, then you have to say, well, how big is that cake? And that cake can only as big, be as big as your mind can imagine. And, and therefore it's, it's limited. So I think to say we have X amount of resources is limiting. I think we have boundless resources on the planet. It's the distribution of the resources that we need to address. Parliament decided when it came to the Falklands crisis to spend an infinite amount of money. And sure enough, they spent as much as was as necessary without batting an eyelid. When they decided to spend money on Trident missiles, the cost of one Trident missile is the same amount as running the whole National Health Service for one year, just for one missile. If Parliament makes and government makes a decision, they, will, they can just push it through. And at the moment we are spending not more than we should do, we're spending far less in this country than any other Western uh, country as a proportion of gross national product. It is impossible to prove that the service has slimmed down. What it is possible to prove is that the amount of building up that has gone into the service has had to struggle to match the increased range of demands that are placed on the service, and I think that will always be so. And my final word would really be this. I would like to think that one day we'll have a more mature political debate about health services than we do at the moment, that people would stop the sort of yabu sucks, uh, empty sixth form debating society rhetoric about cuts, uh, because there haven't been cuts. What there is, is a real problem that we and other developed nations have to face, that there's almost a bottomless pit of demand for our health services, and getting the priorities right within government spending is difficult. But at least I can say that whereas the last government, for all its rhetoric, spent more on defence than on the health service, we actually spend more on the health service than on defence. We're the first government since the NHS was founded, of which that is true. Timeless am I. There is no forward or backward from here. The past is only the breath of the dying. My presence is no monument to wasted moments. My history no tally of the dead and forgotten. When monuments split stones and raise rivers, then build them. When words shake the heart, awaken minds then speak. I am not charity, for you have to take to give. I am not hope, which needs lack to live. I am not faith, the blind sister of truth. I am that which has all or nothing to lose.